This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture. And welcome to the City of God podcast, where we are weekly exploring today's biggest cultural issues all through the lens of God's infallible word. My name is Rob Pacienza, and I'm joined by my co-host, John Rabe. John, welcome back. Thank you, Rob. Great to be with you, as always, and another terrific program today. One of the the hallmarks of this ministry has been uh, our emphasis on America's Christian heritage. That's something that Dr. Kennedy emphasized because it was not well-remembered in the 1970s and the 1980s. It much, it's much better so, thanks to Dr. Kennedy and several others. Um, but uh, it's been a focus of our Providence Forum a- aspect of our ministry. And for today's program, we're going to delve into that with somebody who I think is uh, among the most well-qualified people in the entire world to discuss the issue, uh, a, a person who is just a complete human encyclopedia, and that is our good friend Bill Federer, William J. Federer, a noted author, a noted historian. And and Rob, when it comes to America's Christian history, this guy is just an absolute encyclopedia, a fountain of walking knowledge, and yet also incredibly fun to talk to. I've seen this guy get standing ovations in conferences and in rooms after he after he presents this material. He's a super engaging guy, and we're going to be able to dig deep with him today. Well, Bill has the ability to turn a th- uh, take a three-hour lecture and condense it into about 30 minutes. So, yeah. I mean, it is amazing. He is a just an incredible wealth of knowledge. And uh, I don't think it's an understatement to say that he is one of the great Christian historians of, of our day. Um, as you said, he's an author, speaker, historian, but there's, there's nobody in my mind that does a better job of taking a complex topic like the Judeo-Christian foundation of America with all of its different facets and really helping the average layperson just understand what we mean by a Christian nation. What do we mean by the Judeo-Christian worldview being found uh, the foundational worldview for America's early founding? And uh, just such a treasure for the church, such a treasure for the average layperson that loves both this nation, that is a Christian, loves history, and wants to understand how does it all kind of come together and so incredibly blessed to know Bill personally as, as a friend, a uh, friend of this ministry, but also to have him on the City of God podcast for the first time, but definitely not the last time. Amen. And he, uh, maybe not most importantly, but certainly of high importance as a fellow St. Louisan uh, of mine, he is. Uh, he den- he's, he's not as proud of it as I am, but that's, uh, that is the case. But Bill is uh, one of these people that is, is he has an encyclopedic knowledge. He can, he basically has the original sources memorized. His work has been cited by the United States Supreme Court. I know Clarence Thomas cited uh, one of his sources in a uh, in an opinion not long ago. Uh, that's just, Bill is, is absolutely uh, vital when it comes to these issues. And he also, something that we get into in this conversation is not only how the founders were indebted to God and rooted themselves in God's word, but the miraculous ways in which God provided for America as it was being founded. If a few things had gone any other way, we're not here right now in America as we know it, and yet they happened, and and, and Bill has put together great material. Yeah, so we'll that. cover all that. We'll yep. talk about God's hand of providence over uh, the American founding, the Judeo-Christian worldview being the foundational worldview of our nation, and really how, how all of the freedoms we experience today, and many of us take for granted, all came out of this worldview. Yep. Um, if it wasn't for the Christian message, uh, the West would be unrecognizable, and certainly would the United States. States of America. So without further ado, here is our City of God episode with the great Bill Federer. Bill Federer, so glad to have you on the City of God podcast today. Oh, Rob, great to be with you. So let's dive right in. There is, as you know, this false narrative out there that America was founded as a secular nation. But in reality, you've spent your whole career writing on this topic that without Christianity, there there is no America. Why is the what is the reason for this false narrative? Where did it come from? And and what's really the ultimate agenda? Well, the Judeo-Christian heritage can be summed up in one word, individual that it gives rights and values to the individual. Every other group is 
uh, based on your acceptance or rejection by a group. And whether it's the king and his class, whether in Islam it's the Ummah, the community, in, is, in India it's the caste system, uh, and then in the uh, atheistic countries it's your usefulness to the state if you're a Communist Party member. And uh, when God in the Old Testament said everyone's made in the image of the Creator, male and female, and this Creator's not a respecter of persons, this gave birth to the idea that you have a worth as an individual irregardless of any group that you belong to. And so when we talk about uh, Western civilization, Judeo-Christian values that were implemented in America, basically America empowers the individual. And uh, when we want to preserve our country, we're preserving that you have rights from a creator. And the um, it's, it's worth noting and saving. As far as the Christian aspect goes, I read through every charter of every colony. Mm. Every colony was started by a different Christian denomination. Virginia was Anglican. Massachusetts was Puritan. Rhode Island was Baptist. New York was Dutch Reformed. Uh, Delaware and New Jersey were uh, Swedish Lutheran originally. New York, um, I mentioned that Dutch Reformed, um, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Congregationalist, Pennsylvania Quaker, Maryland Catholic, right? Uh, New Jersey ended up uh, having a lot of Presbyterians and uh, Princeton. And, and so they didn't get along. And they would tar and feather each other. And when the revolution started, they all had to work together against the king. Once we broke away, they had this fear that America was going to pick one denomination and make it the national one, which is their only frame of reference. Every country in Europe, there was a national denomination. England was Anglican, Scotland Presbyterian, Holland Dutch Reformed. Uh, Greece was Greek Orthodox, Russia was Russian Orthodox, um, and then Italy, Spain, France, Austria, Poland stayed Catholic. But it was one denomination per country. They were afraid America was going was to pick, and so they wanted to tie the federal government's hands so that the states could do whatever they wanted. And so religion was under states' jurisdiction. I read through every state constitution uh, in, 19, in 1776. Nine of the original 13 states required office holders to be Protestant to hold state office. Mm. Uh, three, all you had to do was be a plain Christian. And one had zero religious requirements, Rhode Island, founded by Baptists. And they said if you required someone to be a Christian, they could say they were even if they weren't, and that would be hypocritical. And so uh, at the time of the founding, 98% of America was Protestant, one, 3 million people, 1% uh, Catholic, 30,000, mostly in Pennsylvania and uh, Maryland, and, uh, and a tenth of a percent Jewish. And so that was the; uh, those were the states that sent delegates to write the Constitution, and that passed the Bill of Rights. And so they didn't want to outlaw themselves; they simply wanted to tie the federal government's hands so they wouldn't be ruled by mandates from a, a dictator. Yeah. So I think it's pretty fair to say, based on that <laughs> uh, historian's perspective, that the the narrative that we are a secular nation from the beginning is absolutely a false narrative. It clearly is. And and so then that raises the question, the very few who are even honest about the history um, w still want to look at it and say, OK, well, they were people of their time. They they were inconsistent with themselves. Uh, you know, they were they were people of the Enlightenment. That was all changing. So maybe you had these, uh, you know, you had these religious charters and so forth and uh, but but it was it was passing out and it, the the thing that I think it's important for people to understand is that that uh, Christianity is not sort of a a background issue it's not some sort of a sidetrack it's not an aberration that it is central to this project of freedom and liberty that they were trying to build here in America wasn't it right so I read the charters, state constitution, amendments to the state constitutions from every one of the original 13 states from their original colonial founding up to the present. And so Virginia, in its original state constitution, which is still in there today, mm. it says it's, um, uh, it still mentions Christianity in there. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, and then North Carolina's state constitution still mentions Christianity. It's the first duty of a civilized and Christian state uh, to take care of the poor, uh, paraphrase there. And, um, but 1835 is when North Carolina changed its state constitution from requiring all office, office holders to be Protestant to being Christian. That was in effect in North Carolina up until 1868 when they changed it to just believing in God. Maryland's original state constitution, 1776, required all office holders to be Christian. But in 1851, 
They added, and if the party shall profess to be a Jew, the declaration shall be of a belief in a future state of rewards and punishments. In 1864, they changed it to every office holder had to be a Christian or believe in God. And then in 1868, they changed it to all you do is believe in God. But you drop the pebble in the pond, the ripples go out. Yeah. But, but we're talking 1851, you, you had to be a Christian or a Jew to hold office in Maryland. Um, and so people say, well, what about separation of church and state? Easy. That was to keep the federal government out of state business. The Constitution took the power of a king, separated it into three branches. They took the Tower of Babel and scattered it. And the King of England was the most powerful king on the planet, and they wanted to, the sun never set on the British Empire. He was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy, <laughs> India, Australia, New Zealand. They wanted to take his power and separate it. They said, we bend down the road of one person ruling, and if you're friends with the king, you're more equal. You're not friends with the king, you're less equal. You're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. We bend down that road. Let's trust the people. They may make mistakes sometime. But we bend down the king road. Let's so in other words, our constitution is simply a way to keep a president from ruling through mandates and executive orders. Mm. Let me say that again. Our constitution was intended to prevent a president from ruling through mandates mm. and executive orders. I've got a wow. pen, I've got a phone. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. Yeah. It's it's interesting, Bill, when you when you when you think about Christianity's influence, we're not just talking about religious freedom, religious liberty. We're talking about freedoms across the board. Talk to us a little bit about how Christianity did specifically influence the freedoms that we have experienced past and present here in America. You know, uh, Antonio Gramsci was an Italian socialist that got on the wrong side of the Russian socialists and the others who wanted to conquer the West with tanks. And he says, you can't do it through tanks. You got to do it slow it got called the long march through the institutions. In other words, you have to rot the West from the inside. Mm -hmm. And and so he said, um, uh, socialism is a precisely the religion which can defeat Christianity. And uh, the, the West has been, you know, uh, had a 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian heritage and, and that we have to undermine that by infiltrating the institutions, the churches. And that's what they've been doing with this wokeness. Infiltrate the media, infiltrate the universities, infiltrate. And um, so the, um, uh, the push is to move us away from our Christian founding. But, but the, the idea that you get rights from a creator, um, there's a great quote from Eisenhower. He said, in some lands, the state claims to be the author of human rights. If the state gives rights, it can and inevitably will take away those rights. Our founding fathers had to refer to the creator in order to make our revolutionary experiment make sense. Mm -hmm. In other words, we had to claim we had rights from a creator. The government's job is to guarantee and protect to us our God-given rights. Well, if there is no creator, where do your rights come from? Uh, the state, the social com contract, mm -hmm. the social compact, the, the collective, the group, the mob. <laughs> Well, if the state gives rights, the state can take away the rights. What, what they give it, they can take it away. So without God, government transitions from your servant to your master. Without God, government transitions from an entity protecting you to an entity controlling you. It's like if there's a policeman in front of your house, are they guarding your house or are they keeping you prisoner? <laughs> and so with God, we get rights from God. The purpose of the government is to protect our God-given rights. If there is no God, the rights come from the government and they decide what you get and what you don't get. So without God, government transitions from your creator, from your servant to your master. And that's so you, all rooted in biblical Christianity. And yeah. it's amazing. You, you look at Romans 13 and you see the government clearly has been ordained by God, but with limited scope of power. I mean, they, they are here to promote the common good and to restrain evil by the power of the sword. And that's it. It's interesting when you look at government today, particularly the <laughs> executive branch, how the overreach and the weaponization of government has totally twisted the Judeo-Christian worldview of the state upside down. And even as you've already mentioned, our founding documents are totally contrary to what we're seeing in the, the 21st century yeah. here in America. And we have had hundreds of years of this to enjoy now and to even take for granted. And so I think people lose sight of how truly world-changing that idea of the king is 
under the law uh, and, and under God as yeah. the rest of us are. Lex Rex, than, exactly. Rutherford. Yep. And uh, what a, what a, what an absolute sea change that is in human history. But um, Bill, you mentioned along with that when looking at the state constitutions, I forget which state it was that you said, uh, but one of them said, okay, well, it, it starts with you got to be a Protestant. Then it said you can be a Jew, but you have to believe in rewards and punishments uh, at the end. That's very interesting to me because I think that points us to what they were after here. Some people look back on it and say, well, they were just a bunch of bigots. They just uh, everybody had to be exactly like I do and believe exactly like I do. You know, the purpose went beyond that. It wasn't bigotry. It was that there needed to be this recognition of God and even uh, an afterlife and justice and rewards and punishment for a, a self-governing people, correct? Yeah. When you zoom out, it becomes clear. So one of my projects is I decided to research every single century of recorded human history to find out what the most common form of government is. And so writing was invented around three or 4,000 BC. There's even a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist mm -hmm. in Cosmos. his Cosmos TV series. Yeah. And he's in the desert and he says, it was here between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers 5,000 years ago that we learned how to write. And then he talks about how writing allowed for the accumulation of knowledge that you could pass to the next generation. And, and uh, But here he is saying 5,000 years ago. So we're around 2080. That would be around 3,000 BC. Secular historians, that's when writing was invented. And so you got Sumerian cuneiform and Nimrod Tower of Babel, and then the kings of Assyria, kings of Babylon, Cyrus of Persia, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, uh, Tila the Hun, Chandra Gupta in India, 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. Um, you have the Attila the the Hun, Genghis Khan, uh, kings, the most common form of government is kings. Mm -hmm. That's the default setting. It's gangs. If, if there were no laws and no police, we wake up tomorrow, what would happen? Well, it'd be fine for a couple of days. And then people start robbing stores. And when they realize they could get away with it, it's going to be a, a mad rush. And then when the stores are empty, they're going to start going house to house, neighborhood to neighborhood. And so we're going to have to say, we got to find, we got to organize ourselves. And we find one of our group is a little better at knowing how to fight than the rest. And we say, you be our captain. And he's sort of a, a good gang leader. Well, guess what? The most ruthless bad gang leader is going to... And so we're, we're back to gangs. Mm -hmm. And then as they begin to conquer and grow bigger and bigger. So the default setting is gangs, Hatfields and McCoys, tribalism. And um, until they keep getting bigger, because with military advancements, kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, <laughs> you can kill with a bronze weapon or an iron weapon or a phalanx spear that the Greeks had or a scimitar sword that the Muslims had or gunpowder that the Chinese invented. The weapon improves, but it's that same fall in nature of Cain killing Abel. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people. So Augustus Caesar wanted to have the, the first worldwide census, right, for the Roman Empire. He, if he could add 5G and cell phones and cameras, he would have been <laughs> tempted to track people that way. And so these kingdoms keep getting bigger. And then uh, you have what's called the Reformation, and you have this uh, studying of the scriptures of the uh, form of government of ancient Israel 400 years before King Saul. So you have these Protestants, John Calvin, um, he, uh, 1572, you had the Queen of France doing the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre where uh, they killed 30,000 Protestant Huguenots. And so in the French-speaking area of uh, Switzerland, you have John Calvin saying, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. Almost exactly like Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail. He says, one may well ask, how can you advocate uh, obeying some laws and breaking others? He goes, simple, there's two types of laws, just and unjust. He says, we're obligated to obey just laws. Conversely, we're obligated not to obey unjust laws. How does one decide whether a law is just or unjust? A just law squares with the moral law of God. And so, you, you, so why would God tell you to do something in his law and then tell you to, sub, to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just got done telling you to do? <laughs> you submit to the government as long as the government submitted to God. It's like Ephesians 6, children obey your parents. But what if there's a bad parent that tells the kid to uh, sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the child supposed to obey the parent? 
No, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling him to do something that lines up with God's, God's word. We obey the government as long as the government's telling us to do something that lines up with God's word. So John Calvin, these uh, Calvinists, these Puritans and the Presbyterians began to spread this idea of a covenant form of government where you can have lots of people ruling themselves without a king, but it takes every single person to agree to it, to be a part of it. It takes involvement, right? Where, um, uh, and so this turned into their church model of government. And they had the Presbyterian covenanters in Scotland. Um, but it also, when they settled in America, they took their church government, they made it their community government. Yeah, that's and fascinating. There's a quote from Oz Guinness, and he said that um, um, constitution lies behind covenant mm -hmm. and that the American constitution is a secularized form of covenant, but covenant lies behind constitution. And, and so it's a way for us to rule ourselves without a king, a bottom-up form of government versus top-down, but it takes all of us to be involved. It's the difference between a dead pyramid ruled top-down and a living tree bottom-up where every root and every little tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients. So we're a bottom-up form of government, and we need everybody to be involved, everybody to be a part. So let's talk about the Constitution that you just brought up. So John Adams, founding father, said this about the, our Constitution. Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other why is a common morality and religious liberty essential for our form of government and our constitution to actually be effective in this nation? So the constitution is based on a biblical concept of the fallen nature of man. And therefore, Madison said, there's no angels on earth to govern us. There's no people that are beyond the realm of being tempted. I mean, any one of us, if we were in office and we had some family member that had a need, we would be tempted to funnel a little extra to our family and friends on the side. And if there's somebody that we don't like, we're going to be tempted to want to hold something back. It gets discretionary. The saying is, he who holds the purse strings has the power. Sinful human nature always applies. Yeah. So, so that is the underlying premise of the entire Constitution is the biblical concept of the fallen nature of man. Therefore, all all we're left with is selfish human beings. And so uh, the way I use it to, in illustration is I'm one of 11 kids. We have, uh, I have five brothers, five sisters. Wow. And so my mom one time made brownies, and the other kids all ate them up except one. And my little brother and I come in from playing, and we're about to fight over it. And my mom says, one of you cuts it, and the other gets to pick the first piece. Hmm. And the one cutting it doesn't know which piece they're going to wind up with. So they want to cut it exactly what? Equal. Evil, even. It works great unless you did it with my little brother because he spit on him and got both. <laughs> of course, I punched him. But um, but imagine a big brownie, three hungry boys. You give them each a job. The first one's job is to trace out on the brownie where it's going to be cut. He doesn't know which piece he's going to end up with, so he's going to try to trace those pieces exactly what? Equal. Yeah. Second one's job is to take the knife and actually cut the brownie, to execute it, to enact it. And then he doesn't know which piece he's going to get, so he wants to cut them exactly equal. And the third one's job is to judge and see who gets which piece. So you have the legislative branch laying out the law, the executive branch signing it and acting it into law, and the judicial branch judging the law. It's a stroke of genius. They're greedy, hungry tummies causing them to be honest. It would be like a Sunday school teacher giving an assignment. Design a system of government where sinners keep other sinners from sinning. Mm -hmm. Selfish, greedy people keeping other selfish, greedy people from becoming selfish and greedy. It's a three-way tug of war. So the uh, co congressional branch is always going to try to pull power away from the legislative and judicial. And the executive branch is always going to pull power away from the judicial and the uh, legislative. And then the judicial is – it's a three-way tug of war. Mm -hmm. it, it Greed checking greed, ambition checking ambition. And, um, and it, it's worked. We've had the longest-lasting free government – in world history, France has gone through dozens of different re republics and constitutions. Mexico has gone through you know, like like fifty of them. Um, they're they're short lived, and um, the the other concept is a seed and soil. If you think of our constitution as a genetically engineered seed, it took six thousand years, brilliant minds, a lot of sweat and blood to pre produce the seed. But a question: Does the type of soil you plant the seed in have any relation to the harvest you're going to mm. get? You could have the best seed, but if you plant it in a sandy beach, right? Grow. So we get rid of Saddam Hussein, 
and we uh, go over there and give them a constitution almost exactly like ours. And in one election cycle, they vote in Sharia law, it's a death penalty to insult Muhammad, you can have four wives beat your wife. And we're scratching our head thinking, why didn't the seed work? Mm -hmm. Well, you planted in a soil that was Islamic. And Islam has no concept of equality. That Allah loves the faithful Muslim that who has submitted, and God, Allah hates the infidel. And women are not equal to men, right? And, um, and then we saw the Soviet Union fall apart. And we go over to these former Soviet republics, and we help them set up constitutions almost identical to ours. Yeah. And within a short time, they're taken over by the black market, the mafia, the organized crime. We're scratching our head thinking, why didn't the seed produce the same soil? Well, you, pl you planted it in a soil, uh, the same harvest, you, but you planted the seed in soil that had 70 years of atheism plowed into it. Mm -hmm. And atheism says this life is all there is. Do whatever you yeah. can to get ahead. Um, and so in America, we planted this seed into a soil that was 98% Protestant at the time of the founding, 1% Catholic, a tenth of a percent Jewish, nearly completely Judeo-Christian. And the basic element in the soil is everyone is made in the image of the creator, and this creator is not a respecter of persons. And so you go to a political science class in school, you're studying the three branches, you're studying all that. You, you, you don't get a clue that it, the seed only, only works in a soil that's fertile, with Judeo-Christian, doesn't work in an Islamic soil, doesn't work in a uh, atheistic soil. Yeah, well, far from being secular, it sounds like our founding fathers had a better understanding of the Christian doctrine of sin and total depravity than than most pastors in North America do. <laughs> Seriously, today. that's actually really well said because uh, they the, the the genius the ingeniousness of that system is the the thoroughgoing recognition of the human nature and keeping that at bay through these checks and balances, and it's it's just it's just brilliant. And um, so, Bill, that that raises a, a question for me, and, and our time is already running short, but um, the big bogeyman now, we'll get into it, the big, the big bogeyman that's being raised these days is Christian nationalism. And now, as you describe these, the founding era, it sounds like Christian nationalists of one kind or another to me, but uh, uh, what what is your take on so-called Christian nationalism and the the uh, the way that that's being bandied about today as oh you know you're a Christian nationalist as a, a, as a as a label used to sort of dismiss people as raving theocrats who want to cut off hands in the public square, right? So it used to be called Christian patriotism. <laughs> and everybody from George Washington, Lincoln, to Franklin Roosevelt talked about being Christian patriots. Mm -hmm. And Franklin Roosevelt passed out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers in World War II. Blue ones to the Navy, brown ones to the Army. I have a copy of one. Mm -hmm. As commander-in-chief, I take pleasure in recommending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces. Mm -hmm. 1947, Truman uh, 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 enacted the uh, military requirements for cadets. And they all had to attend chapel service, either Protestant chapel, Catholic chapel, or Jewish chapel. Hmm. Um, so with Judeo-Christian country, in 1965, 93% of Americans identified as Christian. 93% in 1965. Mm. It was about 24, 25% Catholic, 16% Baptist, and then the you know Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, or whatever. And um, now it's been going down. And now the most recent Pew, P-E-W poll says that 65% of Americans identify as Christian, but that's still a majority. But you have Franklin Roosevelt saying the whole world is divided between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal. We choose human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. He says um, that we um, need to preserve these, preservation of these rights is, is is vital to the future of Christian civilization. And so it used to be called Christian patriotism, and it's a disingenuous uh, labeling on their part to try to make it na change it to nationalism, mm. like that's somehow it's bad. So scarier. Uh, yeah. And then the, the second answer is what it, nationalism depends on what nation you're in. And if you're in a socialist country like the Nazi. The word Nazi stands for National Socialist Workers People Party. People forget that. Yeah. People forget the, the Soviet Union was what? USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. If you're in a socialist country, you have no rights. 
The government dictates everything. And so nationalism over there is evil. Sure. They're wanting to preserve a, a dictatorial uh, country. But in America, our nation is what? Government from the consent of the governed. That rights from a creator, inalienable rights, which means they can't be taken away and they can't be given away. They are yours. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of right to trial by your peers, freedom to right to possess and bear arms. Our nation that we want to preserve is one that guarantees rights to the individual. That's a good thing. So nationalism yeah. over here is preserving a nation that guarantees individual rights. So the, the first is they switch from Christian patriotism to Christian nationalism. But the second is depends on what nation you're in. The third is nationalism is the opposite of globalism. They want to go back to a one world government. They want to have Nimrod, Tower of Babel on a global scale. And if you, uh, if you think of it, God himself created nations, that he created the borders. It says in heaven, there'll be there people there from every nation and every tongue. Now, why is that important? Nation is opposite of globalism. You, you take this one monolithic entity of a globalist government and you break it into smaller pieces and they pit themselves against each other to keep it in check, to prevent it from concentrating into the hands of, uh, of a globalist dictator. So uh, people that are globalists, the Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, the George, George Soros, all those people, they want to malign anybody that wants to stand in the way of their globalism. And, um, yeah, absolutely. And we can all see through it. I mean, I think the, mm -hmm. the reality of anybody using uh, the, the label Christian nationalism as a derogatory term, their, their entire intent is to silent Christians from being engaged in the public square and to somehow erase history and revise history to make us out to be more of a secular nation yep. uh, from the beginning instead of the nation that we've been talking about the last few minutes. And scare people with that term national. Absolutely. I, I love, okay, Christian patriotism. What are you going to do with that? That's uh, uh, Tell me how they're different yep. and and then tell me yep. what's wrong with Christian but Any patriotism. Christian that was engaged in the public square that understands the influence of faith and particularly Christianity in the public square. Yeah. It's, it's all an attempt of the progressive secularist in our nation to silence Christians and to somehow uh, revise history and rewrite history. And there's a quote from George Washington. He said, to the uh, highest glory of patriot, we should add the, the higher glory of Christian. Yes. And um, yep. I was reading a quote from Teddy Roosevelt uh, in 1906. He says, um, a Negro is lynched. He says, every Christian patriot in America should raise their voice loud in protest against this mob spirit that lynches Negroes, yeah. right? So this is Teddy Roosevelt saying, Christian patriot. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's a term that is we are want to preserve a nation where there's rights, and we want to condemn lynchings. We want to condemn uh, a, a killing of babies in the womb. We want to, yeah. we want to stand up. Um, so the word citizen is Greek. It means co-king, co-ruler, co-sovereign. And we pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic. A republic is where the people are king, ruling through their representatives. And so we're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. Mm. And so when someone protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I yeah. protest this system where I participate in ruling myself. It's like, okay, somebody else right. will rule you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Israel and Saul, really, yeah. And, and recognizing in the pledge that we're understanding and recognizing that we are one nation under who? Under the sovereign authority of God. And as you just mentioned, George Washington, we all know what has happened to George Washington's legacy over the last few decades. Um, a secularist at worst, deist at best in, you know, kind of our current cultural moment. And you understand that George Washington's favorite doctrine was the providence of God. Far from being a deist, he recognized the active providential sovereign hand of God in the affairs of human beings. And I think it's so important that we help people understand, reclaim civics for this for the sake of the next generation. Uh, Bill, one final question. You, you've written many books. One of my personal favorites is Miracles in American History. Uh, just a little side note, we take this book on all of our family vacations. So the, the joke in our family is Bill Federer travels with us on every family <laughs> vacation. My wife is actively reading it to our children as we're traveling from city to city across America. And in it, you write about the impactful stories of 
of God's providential hand throughout American history. What what are some of those providential, impactful events that we can look to and say God's hand surely has been uh, on our nation throughout its history? Well, the first global war was the Seven Years' War, or in America, the French and Indian War. And here's George Washington, and he is the, the, the general. William Braddock was shot, and he's more or less in control, and he's riding his horse. And he has uh, later writes a letter to his son. He had four holes through his coat with a bullet holes, and two horses shot up from under him, but he's unhurt. And he says um, that he gives credit to Providence. Providence gave him courage, this concept that, hey, God has set the time that I'm going to depart and until that time happens, nobody can hurt me. And that gave him courage in battle. So you have another is the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. And there was a loyalist that's somebody that lives in America, but they're loyal to the enemy, right? And this loyalist shows the British where to land and marches them all night long through Jamaica Pass. And they attack George Washington from behind, who's facing the East River in the New York Harbor, because that's where the British ships are. And uh, it's August 27th, 1776, 3,000 Americans die, only 300 British. And this is the entire American army. And it could be over right here, and we would be another British colony like Mm -hmm. Kenya or India. But uh, the Continental Congress had a day of fasting and prayer, and Washington had it read to his troops. But Washington gets every boat he can find, and all night long they're ferrying his army across the East River to Manhattan Island. And um, he gets about half his army across when the sun starts coming up. Now he's really a sitting duck. There's not enough left to fight, and the ones that are in the water, a couple cannon shots will get rid of that. And uh, his chief of intelligence was Major Ben Talmadge. And he says, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still still on duty. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise off the river and settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this providential occurrence perfectly well. And so very dense was the atmosphere that you could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. Well, Washington is able to evacuate his entire army army and continue the fight. And we eventually became independent. Uh, Another is the Battle of Cowpens toward the end of the war. You have some cows, put them in a pen. All right. So it's in South Carolina. And the British have a young 26-year-old Colonel Tarleton. And he's got the Dragoons, which are light cavalry. They can ride really, really fast. They don't carry lots of supplies, but they can ride fast. And they have their sabers. And so uh, at the Battle of Waxhaw, this Colonel Tarleton uh, killed 300 Americans who were surrendering. He told his men to take out their swords and hack them to death. So they call it the the um, Tarleton's Quarters, which means if you get captured by him, he'll kill you. And so Tarleton is racing toward the American army. Uh, Daniel Morgan is our general. And he's got a whole army with lots of wagons. He's moving slow. And he realizes that he can't outrun them. And so he decides where to fight. And... Um, S- sets up with the militia in front, and they're known for shooting a couple times and running away. And then behind them are the Continental soldiers, and, and they, they fire. 800 British get killed. And so the Americans retreat, and the British are chasing them. So the Americans uh, cross the um, Yad, uh, Yadkin River, and the, or Catawba River first, and then uh, the British show up. But before the British can cross, there's a flash flood. And then they get to the Yadkin River. The Americans cross before the British can cross another flash flood. Mm. And then they get to the Dan River. The Americans cross. The British show up. They're watching the Americans get out the other side. And another flash flood. The river's flooding its banks, and they have to give up the chase. And um, the British uh, general said... uh, uh, we would they we would have caught them with Cornwallis his army right there had not uh, God uh, the, the rivers almost miraculously fell to let the enemy across before we showed up and um, so uh, so and then you have uh, civil war um, Lincoln has a day of fasting and prayer to be observed April thirtieth eighteen sixty three the whole nation is fasting and praying two days later a freak accident happens that changes the war. It's the Battle of Chancellorville, uh, and the Confederates are winning two to one. I mean, it's like, an, uh, and then Stonewall Jackson's coming back at twilight. His own men say, stop who goes there. And before he can answer, they let off a volley of shots, kill a bunch of men and horses. He's shot twice in the arm, once in the hand. He has to have his arm amputated, dies a couple of days later. And just about every Civil War historian will say, if Stonewall Jackson had been at Gettysburg, there's a good chance the South may have won. 
the war. Would, and it's hard to reconcile because Stonewall Jackson himself was a godly man. But nevertheless, God's plan was to have the country stay together and end slavery. But it was just two days after Lincoln's National Day of Fasting and Prayer. Um, you have uh, old World War I, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he passed out New Testaments, and he had a day of fasting and prayer uh, in uh, 1918. Uh, you have um, World War II with the D-Day prayer of FDR. And um, and then you have Truman, and he has National Day of Prayer. And even Apollo 13, you have uh, the oxygen tank explodes, and they're up there in space. And um, Nixon has a, a National Day of Prayer, and the whole nation's praying. And, of course, they're able to land successfully. And so it's the, the miracles in American history are we've been a country that have been through crises, and we've turned to the Lord. And if it's one thing I've seen is that God seems to wait until things look hopeless, mm. and then he raises up little nobodies with faith and courage to turn things around. Moses, David, Gideon, this is just our turn. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. Uh, those miracles in American history books are so excellent, and every time we offer them through the ministry, they just fly off the shelves. I know your wife, Susie, uh, intimately involved in that as the author, and then drawing on all your historical research, and so just terrific, and I, I want Susie's contribution there to not go overlooked as well, but uh, Rob, you said it in your own family, these, these, are, these are stories about God's intervention in America that our children and grandchildren need to know. Absolutely. And let, let me just say, if, if, if you're listening to this podcast and you have family, friends, liberal college professors claiming that we were born as a secular nation, founded as a secular nation, and that religion has no place in the public square and have bought into the erroneous wall of separation between church and state, Bill Fetter is your go-to resource. Seriously, I, to read his books, to watch his lectures, and to really uh, reclaim uh, the true story of uh, the founding of America. Uh, Bill, where can our audience find your resources? Uh, share your website. Yeah, well, uh, first, uh, I want to make sure that they visit uh, your website and, hmm. and access that. Um, mine is AmericanMinute.com. Yeah. AmericanMinute.com. And yep. you have a daily commentary that you send out as well with what's going on in American history. It's just a marvelous resource. Absolutely. My, my other favorite book, in addition to Miracles in American History, is Who is the King in America? Yeah. So please check out Bill Federer if you're not familiar with him, his resources, watch his lectures online. Bill, just thank you for your contribution to this cultural moment, uh, for what you're doing, uh, not only for this current generation, but for generations to come. Well, thank you, Rob. John, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you once again for joining us on this City of God episode with Bill Federer. If you enjoyed this episode, please pass this along to family and friends or anyone that might be interested in this topic in particular, talking about the Christian roots of the United States of America. Thank you once again for joining us on the City of God podcast. And until next time, may God richly bless you. The City of God podcast is produced by Coral Ridge Ministries and made in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. Visit us at cityofgodpodcast.com to access all of our previous episodes. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or anywhere you get podcasts. A full video version of this podcast is available on YouTube. This is the City of God podcast where Christ meets culture.